If you did not get a bulletin, please make sure that you do. Um, there's some right behind you, just outside the door. Please grab one of those. Send a kid to go grab that. Send a spouse. Ladies, send a spouse to go get that. Men, don't say that to your wife. Men, go get that. Bring it on back and uh, take a look at it. Let me walk through a few things with you, if you don't mind terribly. We'll keep it quick. All the way at the very bottom of our bulletin, there's a connection card for everyone to fill out, whether you've been here before or not. We ask everyone to fill that out. Later on in our service, we'll pass around an offering plate. If you'd be kind enough to fill in that entire connection card and put it completed into the offering plate, then we'll be grateful for that. A few things to mention. Next week, we're going to be in preparation for the Easter season. We're going to be handing out those invest and invite cards that we've done the last several years. Don't forget why we do that. The invest and invite card is a way for you to mention by name a few people that you're praying for and would like others who are a part of our church to pray for. In fact, don't forget that we also have our 24 hours of prayer coming up. But even leading up to Easter, we're praying for a lot of people that I believe are on your heart that God has allowed us to interact with. So that will be next week that you'll get those invest and invite cards. Please look for those in the service next week. Tonight we begin choir practice at 4 o'clock. If you didn't yet sign up, there's still time to do that at the Info Center after the service today. But I hope you'll join us. Come and be a part of our Easter choir by signing up for that. Two more weeks, in fact a little less than two weeks now, we'll be having our Weekend to Remember time for all couples. That's going to be in the Chicago area, Lincolnshire, Chicago. If you are not aware of what that is and you'd like to sign up, just see me and I'll be happy to give you more information. There's also brochures back at the Info Center along with a link that allows you to sign up under our group to get a discount. So please make sure that you do that. I hope to see you as a part of that Weekend to Remember. It'll be a great time, a Friday through a Sunday. Would you join me? Let's stand together. We're going to pray in a moment, and then we're going to sing as well. But I'd like to invite all of you to stand with me while we acknowledge this simple fact. Here you walk into the service. You probably share a conversation with people. You see some elements spread out before you on the table. I know that there are parts to the service that seem routine, that seem like, yeah, I've been here before. I kind of understand this. Or maybe you're brand new and you don't know all of that. I want to invite you to recognize what's going on, why we're assembling here. It's not because it's 9.30 on a Sunday. It just happens to be the time that we coordinated. But we call this a worship service. And there's a reason for that. It's because we want to reflect the majesty and glory of God and the way that we interact with each other. Worship already began long before you walked through those doors, long before you came into this auditorium. But we'd like to continue it during our service as we sing, God be praised. Let's pray, and then we'll sing that song together. God, we love you. We commit this service to you. We thank you for the freedom that allows us to gather like this. Thank you for the ability to exercise the faith in you that you've, you've granted us. I pray for our service today. I pray for all those who are a part of it. I pray for every man and woman and child here. God, there's some here who this morning are hurting. There's some who are struggling. There's some who are coming through dark times in their lives. And Father, they're seeking answers. And I, I believe that your word is where we find them. And so thank you. Thank you for allowing us to spend this time together. I pray that you might get all the glory and the praise from what we do and say during our service this morning. And I pray all of it in the name of your son. Amen.
There's a, a saying that we, we say here from time to time here, but it's that we want our theology to drive our doxology, which means this, that we want the truth of Scripture, the, the truth of theology, the knowledge of God and who He is and what He has done to then drive our praise, to drive our doxology. So as these songs that we've just sung are, are sung because they're rich in theology, and then from that there should just well within us this, this joy and excitement to praise Him and to make much of Him. So even as we enter into this time here, as we enter before communion, where we're going to eat a piece of bread, we're going to drink a, a, a cup of, of grape juice, we want our theology, even in this moment, to drive this act of worship, this, this act of doxology and, and praising God for who He is. And so I want to read this morning from Romans chapter 5, which again should just stir within us just such joy and gratitude and thankfulness for what Christ has done for us on our behalf. But follow along. In verse 1, the Apostle Paul says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And more than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But listen to this verse here. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. And more than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Here's what we want to lay before us this morning. You and I had nothing to do with our salvation. This, I mean, this passage here is dripping with, with the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf, on your behalf. In fact, verse 8, we pause there for a moment just to let that sink in. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, while we were rejecting him, while we were running from him, while we wanted nothing to do with him, Christ died for us. That, that, is, that is the hope in which we stand. That is a love that is unshakable. That is a love that, that will never run dry. That's a love that will never escape you. The love that God has for you. Um, and it's been displayed clearly through the work of Jesus Christ in his selfless, sinless life, his sacrificial death. And then as we just sung about his glorious resurrection to, to shore up and affirm for us the hope in which we stand in our salvation. And I even love where Paul says this, it's the grace of God that's been given to us, and it's the grace in which we stand. Like we stand in this grace. Again, so I mean, it's just dripping in the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. And so from that, we want our theology, we want the truth of the word of God to then drive our doxology, to drive our praise. And so as we gather here this morning, we're gonna eat this, this bread and we're gonna drink this cup. And what that does is it's representing exactly what we just read that Christ came, that Christ lived sinlessly for us, that Christ died on a, on a cross for our sins. He absorbed the wrath of God that was due us. He took it upon himself so that he could then give us grace and mercy, blamelessness, salvation. And so this is why we, we eat this bread, to remember this truth. So as we eat this bread this morning, that's what we're remembering, the, the broken body of Jesus Christ on the cross for you and for me. As we drink this cup, we're remembering the blood that was shed because of my sin, because of your sin. Yet through faith, through faith, we have been justified. And verse 1 again says we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're, not, we're no longer enemies. We're no longer outcasts. We have, we have peace with him. We've been reconciled to him. We're sons and we're daughters. This is a glorious, majestic truth that we as the church, this is why we gather to make much of him for what he has done. And so we want to remember this. And so this is what this time is about. And, it's, and, and who it's for, it's, it's for the believer. It's for the Christian. And so if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, meaning this, it's not that you're just sitting at church today. 
But if, if your faith and your hope and your trust is, is continually in Jesus Christ to be made right, and it's not in your good works, it's not in your good actions, it's not in anything that you think that you are accomplishing, but it's like I'm trusting in Jesus Christ to make me right. We're, we're inviting you. You are a Christ follower in that, in that sense. We're inviting you to take part in this today as we, as we administer this, this Lord's Supper. If you're not a believer here this morning, we say this every single month when we, when we take this, we want this time to be a testimony to you. It, it, so it's okay to let the tray pass by you. It's, it's okay. We're not going to judge you. We're not going to look down upon Upon you because you're not participating in this aspect of the service, but we want this time to be a, a testimony to you of your need for God's grace, of your need to trust not in yourself to, to be made right, to find peace with God, but to trust in Jesus Christ and Him alone for salvation, for hope, for peace, and for reconciliation, be sons and daughters of, of God Most High. And so we want to urge you this morning, if you're not a believer here this morning, we're so glad you're here. But, but you're in here from beginning to end today, this, this plea to you to believe, to trust, to repent and confess your sins and come find grace in, in Jesus Christ. And so we want to also take this time here just to confess sins. As believers, this is a time for us to not only rejoice in the fact that we stand in God's grace, but to confess our sins. And so um, earlier this morning, we, I, I did communion with our worship team so they could just spend this time um, just leading you through this. And as we were talking um, back in my office before we took communion together, uh, one of the things I said was, man, it's only 9 o'clock and I've already had probably sins in my life that I need to confess. Like, I am an imperfect human being. And so we want to continually confess our sins uh, before, before Christ. And so we want to take this time seriously to say, okay, I want, if there's any unconfessed sin in your life before you take that bread, before you drink that cup, to confess that sin to Jesus Christ and then find forgiveness and grace and peace. So we take this time seriously, but we also rejoice in this time because Jesus is not still in the grave. He has risen. Praise the King. He is alive, right? And so that's what this time is about. So I want to invite the, the deacons to come up and We'll take some time here to pray together. We'll take the bread first and then the cup.
So in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul's talking about Jesus taking the, the Lord's Supper and on the night that he was betrayed and was going to the cross. So it says this, that when he had given thanks, he broke it, talking about the bread. And he said this, that this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
Jesus says that in the same way, he also took the cup and after supper saying this, that this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you that you are good, that you have loved us, and that you've given your life for us. And so, though we were sinful and running from you, you came and you gave your life for us so that we could have new life. And so, God, may we never forget that. And so, until you come again, we will continually bring ourselves back to this table so that we can remember your broken body and your shed blood as our only source of salvation and as our only hope. <clears throat> so God, this is what we lay before you, and I pray that we would be stirred to worship, be stirred to be generous, be stirred to take this message and proclaim it uh, to a world that is still yet to believe and yet to hear and yet to respond. And so God, use this church in a mighty way, not for our name, but for yours. And for all glory and honor and praise goes to you and your name and your name alone. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So as we stand here, we, we, uh, we give every time after we take communion to go towards something we call our benevolence offering. And so um, just as God has given us his son, we in respond want to live generous lives with, with how we live, with our time, with our resources, but with also with our finances. And so each month we take a, an, an offering here that goes 100% to those inside and outside of our church who are just struggling financially, whether it be rent or, or with paying utilities or just wherever they may be in need. We want to be a uh, source of hope to those in our community and those in our church as well. So as the deacons come, we're going to sing this song again. Um, let me just encourage, let's give, let's give generously in response to what God has given to us. So let's sing the song together and let's continue to worship.
great thing to sing this morning, that we are part of the family of God because of the mercy that God has shown us through sending Christ to pay our sin debt at the cross. We can declare together as a loud congregation of people indeed that Jesus saves. This is the time in our service where we take a short break. It's a chance for the kids to go ahead and be dismissed through to the kids program. It's for kids ages fifth grade and down, right out through the doors to your left, and we'll resume here in just a few minutes. back to your seats. Go ahead and stand. morning. Good to see you guys. I love hearing you guys sing. That's just great. Love it. Anybody ever get exhausted through singing? I was getting exhausted today, but like, man, it's, it's, a, it's like a good exhaustion. Love it. Love it. All right. Well, it's great to see you guys again. We are now in the home stretch of Ecclesiastes. We have two more weeks left, counting, counting this week here. So Ecclesiastes chapter 9 is where we're going to start today. So go ahead and get there, Ecclesiastes chapter 9. We're going to be at the end of chapter 9, going into the majority of chapter 10 today. So if you need a Bible um, around you, page 451, 452 is where you'll find Ecclesiastes chapter 9. So just a really quick recap as we t- jump in now to this final few chapters here. Over the last 
12 weeks, really, um, as we've been walking through this book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, who wrote this book, has been trying to teach us just basically one simple thing, one simple truth in a number of different ways, but he's been teaching us that if you're trying, to, okay, to find meaning or purpose or, or satisfaction in anything that is on this earth, or as he said, kind of under the sun, he, he says, you're, you're chasing the wind. It's a phrase that he has used throughout this book. You're chasing the wind, meaning this, you're never going to actually catch it. Okay, so if you ever try to think through, okay, can I catch wind? No, you can't, right? Like it's always going to be in front of you. And so he's saying that's what it's like if you're trying to find meaning and joy and purpose in anything that's been created. It's like chasing the wind. You're not actually ever going to catch it. And he's used just example after example after example to kind of prove this point. So, so relationships, he's saying, so relationships, no matter how amazing the other person may be in that relationship, they still will never fully satisfy you, okay? So, so your career, he's, he talked about that, your career, even if you love your job, right? If you love your job, it's still, it's never going to complete you and, and give you this total joy that, that, you're, that you're craving. So even if, 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 it, if you're in a job that you just love, you wake up every morning, can't wait to get to work, right? Like you're still gonna have those days where you want to quit, right? Like that's just life in a fallen, broken world. Like even your job, it's not going to complete you. If you pursue money, he, he's saying this, you're never gonna have enough. You'll never have enough if your, your end in life is to just be rich. You'll never have enough. In fact, a few weeks ago, if you remember, we quoted um, John Rock- Rockefeller, one of the, one of the we- wealthiest individuals to ever walk the face of this planet. And he was once asked a simple question, um, what million that he has earned has been his favorite, at which he responded, my next million, right? So, so he, again, he even had everything ha- at his disposal, but it still was never enough. So riches will never, ever fulfill you completely and totally. It's chasing the wind. So even, even our families, our families were not given to us all right, to, to make sense of our life or to give our lives the, the meaning that we crave. I mean, the... The emotional roller coaster that I go through with my kids is, is nuts, right? Like, like, I love them to death, but there are days when I just want them to go away, right? Like, is that, is that okay for me to say that here? Like, we, we talk about this being a safe place. If it's a safe place for you, it has to be a safe place for me too, all right, there's, there's just days where it's like, I just love them, and in 10 seconds later, it's like, oh my goodness, mom, dad, can you watch them for it? I'm saying like, it's, you have this, these, these roller coasters of emotions, and so as good as families are, again, they're not going to complete you and give you what your life craves and desires, and see, what Solomon is saying is, is that nothing that was created will ever satisfy you fully and completely, just, it, and it wasn't intended to, and, and if we're just honest with ourselves, we know that's true, we know that's true. I, I, I don't think Ecclesiastes, really anything that we've been going through over the last 12 weeks, I don't, I don't think it's revealed anything to us that we probably don't already know or have experienced to some degree or another in this life. But see, what happens is be, because we're sinful, because we're fallen, because we're broken, what, what happens is we, we ignore the kind of clear warning signs in life. And, and what I mean by that is all these signs that nothing is ever satisfying. Why, why do we have this sense of having to go from one thing to the next? Like these are these warning signs that, that God's giving us to say it's not there, but because we're fallen, because we're broken, because we're sinners, we, we kind of just try to survive in life on these little highs, Right, like going from this high to this high to this high, just going from new thing to new thing to new thing, just trying to almost just survive life. Uh, a few years ago, I was, I was counseling a guy who was, he was struggling with, with drug dependency. And uh, as we were talking, he, he revealed, just in our conversations with each other, like he just revealed, plain and simple, I, I do it because I just love the high it gives me. Like that, that just came out, as, I just love that high. Like that's what I want, that's why I, that's why I do it. He loved that feeling. And, and as we talked, um, I didn't try to deny the fact that that high that he was experiencing each time like was real and felt good. Like it, it did. Like if it didn't, he wouldn't have kept going back to it time and time and time and time again. But what, what I tried to get him to think through and what we were asking and talking through is, Okay, why do, you, why do you have to keep going back to it time and time and time and time again? And he said very honestly, he said, well, because it wears off. That high wears off. 
And then I'm back to feeling miserable again. So I, so I have to keep going back to, to chase that high. Even though it's temporary, I, I, I just need it. I was craving that. And as I was thinking through that this past week, I was just thinking that, that, that's the essence of the problem that, that Solomon's even trying to bring out here. And it's, it's what Solomon's trying to share with us here throughout Ecclesiastes, that we're chasing so often these temporary highs in life, whatever they may be, and, and they just don't last, but we keep going back to them time after time after time. So, so what happens is we just try to get through life with these temporary little highs rather than seeking right, the soul-satisfying riches of relationship with our Creator. So, so you see, Ecclesiastes is this invitation to something bigger, to something better. It's this invitation to a joy that never fades, a high that never, that never comes off its peak but only grows and grows and grows. Like that, that's the essence of this book and the, and the sooner that we can grasp this truth that, that's seeking to reveal in us, the sooner that we can actually begin to realign ourselves with actually how we are meant to live on this, on this earth. And, and now what I love about these last few chapters as we're gonna be getting into a couple of them here today and then uh, the last few next week is he's not saying this. He's not saying since nothing in this world will satisfy you. He's not saying, well, you might as well just go crawl into some dark hole somewhere and just wait for the sweet release of death. That's not what he's saying. But, but now he's, he's going to now pull back and say, okay, now that your eyes are being lifted off of, 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 of the creation and, and onto the creator, he's now going to start getting to, okay, now here's how you live. Here, here's how you can live. When you're realigned, with this idea that nothing in this world will satisfy you, that's all vanity, it's all meaningless, and your eyes can, can start to look upwards to the creator instead of the creation. He's like, now, now you're in a position where you can live as you were meant to design to live. And that's where we're getting at today. I mean, he's saying simply, you still have life, right? He's saying you still have a life to live, so, so let's live it. Let's live it intentionally. Let's, let's live it as, as we were designed to live it, so, so here's a question just to think through as we walk through this passage this morning. What are you doing with it? What are you doing with your life? How are you living your life? God in his wisdom, his wisdom has created us to live in a certain way. And, and I love that in his wisdom, he's created us to live in a certain way that's for our good and for his glory. Like, it, the way that he lines us up to live, it's for our good, and it's for his glory. So that means that there is a way to work, all right, that's for your good and for God's glory. There's a way to live in relationship with others that's for your good and for God's glory. There's a, there's a, there's a way to use our time that's for your good and for his glory. So this is what he's going to lay out for us here. So let's begin reading. Chapter 9, very end of it, verse 17. He says this, he says, the words of the wise heard in quiet are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. He says, dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off a stench, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart inclines him to the right, but a fool's heart to the left. Here's what he's saying. There are two ways to live in this life. That's basically what he just boiled down, that last verse, verse two. There's two ways that you can live your life. You can be wise or you can be a fool. So there, there's no middle ground. He's saying you can either live a, a life that's wise or you can be a fool. And in the end, what he's saying here is it, it doesn't matter how smart you are, it doesn't matter how rich you are or how poor you are, it has nothing to do with how pretty you are or what resources you have at your disposal. You can, you can, no matter who you are and what situation you find yourself in this life, you can live life that's wise or you can live life like a fool. And, and so we are, we are all, no matter who we are, if we're sitting here hearing my words, we're all then to look at our lives, look introspectively at our lives and evaluate, okay, which direction am I heading? Am I heading the, the direction of the wise or am I heading the direction of the fool? That the wise person, all right, as laid out throughout this book, is, is one who's understanding that this world, that this creation, that this universe, now, the things in it are not what satisfy or bring sustaining joy. The, the, the wise person is going to pursue Christ. 
They pursue their creator. They've submitted to him, all right? They submit to the rule and reign of God most high, and now they're walking in obedience to God's command. The the wise person has their hope laid up for them in heaven, not on this earth. Their identity is wrapped up in who they are in Christ. We've talked about that even this morning. We are sons and daughters. We're redeemed. We're reconciled. That's our identity. That's who we are. Our value and worth does not come from what others say or think of you. Our Our value and our identity and our worth comes from who God says we are because of Jesus Christ. The wise person, that's their pursuit. That's the pathway of how they're walking and they see everything through the lenses of that. It's the gospel. So this is the wise person. But Solomon says this even in in another book that he wrote, in the book of Proverbs, verse 7. It's on screen here. It says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So again, as we're talking through, okay, what is the pathway of of the wise? Again, he's laying this out even in another book that he wrote, the Proverbs. The, The wise man all right, is going to fear the Lord, okay? So in our pursuit of and our, sub, our submission to and our understanding of who he is is what separates the wise from the foolish. That, so, so again, we say it this way. There are two ways that we can live in this world, that we can walk life in this world. So are you walking the path of the wise? Are you walking the path of the wise? Are you pursuing Christ? Is, is your life Is your life marked by an obedience to how he's called you to live, regardless of if you like it or not, right? Like, okay, are you submitting to saying, okay, I know everything within me doesn't want to obey this command, but I know it's for my good and for his glory, so I'm going to pursue this. That, that's submission. That's, that's saying I'm, I, I'm small and God is big, and so I'm going to follow his leading. That's, that's a wise person. That's a wise way of thinking of life. Say, so we, are we obeying him? And I mean this, in every arena, every area of your life, it, it does not mean that you're perfect. Please don't hear me say that. It does not mean that you will be perfect in this life, but it does mean that you are chasing the one who is. So so that's the life of a wise person as has been outlined throughout Ecclesiastes. But but let's look at the fool. Let's look at the fool because that's where Solomon's gonna go and spend the rest of his time really looking at. So verse three of chapter 10, he says this. It says, even when the fool walks on the road, he lacks sense. And he says to everyone that he is a fool. All right, so a fool has no idea where he's going, all right? A fool has no idea where he's going in life. So this idea where he says the, the fool is walking on a road means this, that he is, he is clearly seen by everyone, all right? So just think of someone walking down Main Street or walking down Veterans Parkway. They're not hiding in the bushes. They're not trying to, 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 to sneak around anywhere. They're walking clear open where everybody's at. And, and what Solomon's saying is a fool lacks sense, has no idea where he's going, and everybody is seeing this. He has no clue what's going on in life. See, when Solomon says that he lacks sense, that, lit- that phrase there literally is being translated by Solomon saying this, that this guy has no brains. Like, that's what he's saying. This guy has no brains whatsoever. So a fool here is someone, listen, who thinks the universe just revolves around them. A fool is someone who just thinks that everybody else on this earth exists for their pleasure, right? That, that's, a, that's a mindset of the fool, that everything here that I see is about me. I'm the center of the universe. That's why he's saying walking down a road, kind of like someone just w- would be walking down the middle of Veterans Parkway and think, well, all these cars need to get out of my way right? Like, that's a, that's a fool, and that's what Psalm is trying to, to lay out here. So again, I'm going to say it this way. A fool is someone who thinks that the universe is revolving around them. Matt Chandler, he says it this way, that the fool is the man who pretends he's indestructible and that he stands at the center of the universe. He says the fool is the one who feels big despite the fact that the universe is screaming out to him that he is small. So, so think about that. Um, if we were to get in a plane right now and fly out west and, and take you to the shore of the Pacific Ocean and we just stood there and just looked at the crashing waves as they came just crashing in, like nobody who is wise stands there in that moment thinking I'm indestructible, right? Like as they see, it's like 50-foot waves coming in. You know what I'm saying? Just a massiveness thing. No, no one with a right mind who has brains is looking at that saying, 
You know, well, I can just do whatever I want. I'll walk out there. That can't do anything to me, right? Nobody standing at the base of Mount Everest looks up and thinks they're, they're almighty and all-powerful. See, this is, this is God's creation that he's laid out and, and just breathed into existence, screaming out to you and to me that we are small and we are finite. Uh, uh, but a fool looks, looks inwardly and thinks they are what is most important. Like, like the wise will look outside of themselves and, and submit to God who created it all. All right, see, that's that fear of God that is the beginning of knowledge, understanding who God is and what they are and who they are in light of him. That's the wise person, but a fool looks inwardly and thinks, nope, I am what's most valuable in this life. But see, look what he says next in verse four. He says, if the anger of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your place, for calmness will lay great offenses to rest. So he's gonna kind of give us um, some bad news and then just some hope through that, I guess. It's, it's only as best Solomon can do here, if you've been sticking with it here. He, so here's what he's saying in verse four. He's saying, um, you're gonna find fools everywhere, right? You're gonna find them everywhere. In, in fact, the world, he says, is so broken that fools will even rise to power and the wise will actually end up having to work for them and submit to them as their earthly authority. That's what he's saying in verse four, all right? Anybody ever worked for a fool before? Yeah, right? No one wants to raise their hand, right? But like, like yeah, but the, our snickering says, yeah, we have, we have. Um, I, I probably opened myself up a little bit there. I, I didn't see any of my staff open up, but we, we know that, right? Like, man, we've, we've had those moments where it's like, how did this guy get to where he is? And he's running, he's in charge of all, I mean, you him, that's what Solomon's saying here. Fools are everywhere, and they rise to power, and the wise actually will have to end up working for them time to time. And, and what he's saying is that the wise, because they're smart, they, wanna, they just want to escape and get out of that, right? Like, I'm just get out of here. But, but here's what Solomon's saying. There's a little bit of hope here. He's saying, take, take a breath. He's saying, calm down and relax. That's what he was saying in verse four. But the question is, okay, why? Why calm down? Why relax? Well, two things. Well, ultimately, because for the wise, for those who are pursuing Christ, our trust isn't in man, but in the Lord, okay? So that's first and primary. But secondly, this is what Solomon's saying, there's nowhere else to go where you won't encounter fools. I mean, that's literally what he's saying. You can try and escape, but you're gonna go somewhere else, and guess where there's gonna be people there? There's fools. You can go find a job somewhere else, guess what? There's gonna be a boss that's gonna be a fool. They're everywhere. So, he, so he's saying this, stay, stay where you are, okay? Work hard, stay calm, and trust the Lord. That's what verse four is, is about. But he keeps kind of going with this idea of this broken world in which we live. Look at verse five. It says, there's an evil that I have seen under the sun as it were an error proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in many high places and the rich sit in the low place. I've seen slaves on horses and princes walking on the ground like slaves. Okay, Here, here's what he's saying. He, he's saying the world in which we live is so maddening and so broken that, that those who you would think should be exalted and should be ad, ad, admired are forgotten and dismissed and the fools of the world are those who are talked about and, and paraded around and are emulated. Like that's what he's saying here in those couple of verses here. Like he's like, this is the madness of the world in which we live. It's why he said this is, the, this is an evil that I've seen in the world. So, so we're once, think about even just culturally here today, we're once in our culture, maybe decades and decades ago, those who were admired or emulated in our, in our time were people who were accomplishing actually important, great things, right? So, so think doctors and scientists and others who are just bringing real change and even maybe social change to a, to a culture that, that needed it, right? To a world that needed it. And they were, they were the ones that were kind of talked about and parade, like, man, I want to be like that person one day. But, but what are we doing today, right? Think about, think about the people that we, we glorify and we parade around today. I mean, we're in a culture today where we're glorifying stupidity debauchery and wickedness, right? right? And that's what Solomon's saying. He's like, this is an evil. Like, what is going on? I and mean, it's plastered. This is plastered all across the front covers of magazines. And, re and listen, pretty much every reality TV show is about this parading of stupidity and debauchery and wickedness. Like, he's like, th and this is what we spend our time talking about and watching. And, and, and Solomon's saying, this is crazy. This is madness, 
This is the brokenness of the world in which we live, where we have a day, uh, a time and, and day right now where, where people are famous, where we literally have a phrase, they're famous for doing nothing, right? Like we, that we've said that. What are they famous for? I don't know, they haven't done anything. I mean, it's the madness and the vanity of the world that we live in. So what do we do? Because this is where we started. Okay, how though do we live? How do we live wisely in the midst of madness and craziness and brokenness? We'll look at verse 8. 8 through 11 here. He says, He who digs a pit will fall into it, and a serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall. He who quarries stones is hurt by them, and he who splits logs is endangered by them. The iron is blunt, and, and, the, and one does not sharpen the edge. He must use more strength, but wisdom helps one to succeed. If the serpent bites before it is charmed, there is no advantage to the charmer. So again, what, he, what Solomon's going to do is he's going to help us here, but not before giving us just another smack of reality. That's just kind of what Solomon does. Like, he can't just say, here's, here's something cheery and chipper for you. He has to like, I'm going to give you something cheery and chipper and hope I'm going to actually bring you down first before I actually say it. So he's saying this in those first couple verses. He's saying, life is hard and oftentimes it will be unfair. So, so he's saying this. He gives this example of a guy who gets up day after day after day and goes to work day after day after day doing the same job over and over and over and over again. So he knows the routine. He knows the rhythm. He's going to his job. He understands it. He gets it. It makes sense to him. Um, he doesn't have to think much through that. So he's like, this is just this guy who's just going through life every single day doing what he knows to do, what he's been doing probably last 20, 30 years. And he's saying there's, con- there's sometimes there's a day where he wakes up, goes through the rhythm, goes to work, is doing his job and a freak accident happens and he dies. He's saying that's life sometimes. He's like it's harsh. Like that's harsh. It's difficult. It's seemingly, we look at that and say that's, that's not fair. Like that's not right. So he's saying life is difficult. Life is hard. But then he uses this just really, really great illustration with, with a guy who's just chopping down trees with this ax he says this, he says before he, he gets to work, he, he knows what he needs to do and knows what he needs to accomplish and knows how to accomplish it. So, so Solomon's saying he's looking at his tool to accomplish this work, which is this ax. And he says he looks at the blade, he sees that the blade is dull. So instead of him just going out there and just working harder to chop down a tree, which you would have to do with a, a, a dull ax blade, says the guy, because he's wise, he goes, he sharpens it before he actually gets to work. And that's just, this is such a simple thing. We might, we might look past this, but this is so profound. A powerful illustration here. Because he's saying this, he's saying it's better for you to work smarter than harder. He's saying it's better for you to go through life thinking smarter and thinking through what you're about to accomplish and what you're wanting to accomplish than to just put your head down, plow through, and just try to get through it. He, he's, he's also talking about this intentionality and purpose that we are to attack life with. So, so think of what Solomon's talking about in this text today. Like he's contrasting these two ways to live, okay? The, the wise living versus the foolish living. And, and he's saying here that, that the wise person in life knows where they're going, right? Knows where they're going uh, and, and that they're working and that they're thinking through a plan to get there. Like, that, that's what he's talking about here. He, they're thinking through, okay, here's where I want to be. Here's where I want my life to be in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years from now. Okay, here's the plan that I'm, I'm putting together, disciplining myself to get there. He's saying that's, that's a wise way of walking through life. I mean, what a, what a great point of just, just simple application for us. I mean, as a, as a Christian, which, which means this, as a Christ follower, think through, okay, what are our what are our main goals in life? What, what is your main goal? So as a Christ follower, what are the goals that you have in life? So, so let me break this down even just for me personally. Like I have, I have three simple things, three simple goals in, in my life. I, so I'm, I'm a husband, so that's one of my roles. I'm a husband. Okay, so, so what is my goal? I want to love my wife well. How? Just as Jesus loved the church. So there's my goal. There's my aim. All right, I want to I be a godly husband who loves my wife well and leads her to see and save her and treasure Jesus Christ above all things. All right, so I want to lead her well in the home. So that's, that's one of my goals, one of my roles. But the second one is I'm a, I'm a father. 
Okay, so I, I want to disciple and I want to lead my children, again, to see and savor Jesus Christ. I want to pray for them. I want to care for them. I want to be patient with them, even when all these things war against that. You know what I'm saying? Like these are sanctifying things in my life. Okay, I want to, but I want to lead my family. I want to lead my children. I want to lead my wife well. So I have those two simple goals there. But my third one is I'm, I'm a pastor. So this is what God has called me to here. I'm a, I'm a pastor. So what is my goal? Well, I want to pastor well. So, so what's that mean? I want to preach and teach the gospel. Like that's, what, that's what I'm called to do. So I, that, there's my goal. I want to each year get better at it, better at it, and better at it. So I'm, what am I laying out in my life to get me there? This is what Solomon's trying to get us to think through how we go through life. I mean, that's, that's it broken down. Like, like, know what your goals are. Know where you're wanting to go. And he's saying, think through how you're going to get there and how you're going to accomplish that by the grace of God. I mean, that's, that's it broken down broken down at least for, for me, but, but practically speaking, what are your goals? What has God called you to? And, and then how are you planning to flourish and thrive in those things? M- maturity, growth, and, and fruit, I mean, I hate to break it to us, but it's not, it's not just going to happen, right? Like, I've, I've heard a pastor say it this way, that nobody ever stumbles into godliness, Right, like there's, there's discipline that's taking place in our lives to say, okay, here's where I want to be, here's where I want to go, so here are the things I need to put in my life so I can continue on that trajectory there, that pathway there. So, so how, are we, how are we getting there? That's, that's the pathway, that's the walkway of the wise. See, a wise person acknowledges this. They, they make a plan, they chart their path, knowing that there's gonna be different things all over the place that are gonna seek to distract them and different detours. Okay, that's, that's going to happen. We live in a broken, fallen world, but we keep our eyes, okay, where has God called me to? Where are the goals I have in my life? What is he calling me to accomplish? All right, this is where I'm gonna go, and here's the things I need to do in my life to get me there. That's, that's the pathway of a wise person, but a fool, a fool completely disregards that completely disregards it. And, and, and they continue, a fool will continue to wander around aimlessly with no direction, no goals, no real path forward. Like they might be working hard, so a fool might not necessarily be lazy, although if we were to continue going in chapter 10, that's actually another mark of a fool is, is laziness, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're always lazy. They might be working hard, they're putting their head down, they're, they're going, they're talking a big game, but in the end, it's still they're going nowhere. And like he said at the end or the beginning of chapter 10, everybody around kind of sees that like, I mean, you're not, yeah, you're working hard, but you're not accomplishing anything. A, a fool will talk a lot. And, and talk a big game, but, but their lives are not backing up what they're talking about. See, look at verse 12. It says, the words of a, a wise man's mouth win him favor, but the lips of a fool consume him. The beginning of the, of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is evil madness. A fool multiplies words, so no man knows what is to be, and who can tell him what will be after him? The toil of a fool wearies him, for he does not know the way to the city. So, so, a, a fool, a fool surrounds themselves with yes men and, and just other people who are just stuck in the same rut that, that they're going through in life. And Solomon's saying that a fool is exhausted, they're tired, and they're weary because they're just kind of wandering through life and they're just not, they're just not going anywhere. But see, a, a wise person will, will surround themselves with other wise people. I think I've heard it this way before, that the A-plus people, A-plus personality people will surround themselves with other A-plus personality people because they want to continue to push themselves and grow. But like a, a B-plus or a B-minus personality or a C personality surrounds themselves with other Cs or Ds or Fs because they want to look smart in the midst of who they have around them. But see, a wise person, if they're, even if they're that B, a wise person will say, I'm going to get A's around me. Because here's where I want to go. Like, I want to I emulate them. I want to be like what they're doing. I wanna, man, they're loving their wives well. How are they doing? I'm going to surround myself with them. I want to get to where they are. See, that's a wise person who's acknowledging that, but a fool is saying, well, I'm good where I am. Let me put other people around me to make me feel better about where I am. I mean, I think about that personally for me. Like, I, by God's grace, man, I, I want to be around other guys who have loved their wives well, who, who have led their kids to, to, to treasure Jesus who've worked hard in their life, but, but work smart. And, and again, not that they're perfect, but they, they love Jesus and their hope is in him. 
I, I just want to be around guys like that because like, that's where I want to be. When I see myself 25, 30 years from now, okay, I want to be like that guy. All right, so I need to be around them. So, so I'm hearing and get just gleaning wisdom from them. So, so again, we come back to this question of where are you headed? Where, where are you going in life? What direction are you moving in? Are, are, you, are you moving the direction of the, of the wise or are you moving in the direction of, of the fool? And, and even if you're sitting here thinking like, I, I don't even know where to start. Am I a fool because I don't even know where to start? Like again, that, that fear, like no, I, I would say that's, that's the start of wisdom right there. Like, okay, where, where do I begin? And I, I, I want to pull you back to what we read earlier in Proverbs chapter one, verse seven, where it says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You, you, start, you start there. You, you begin there with, with who God is and who you are in light of him. What, what, what are you hoping in? What are you trusting in? Are you believing and are you pursuing Jesus above all things? Are you laying everything that's created to the side so that you can pursue something that's better? Like that's, that's where you begin. Begin with this knowledge of I just want to know God. I want to be around him. I want to be known by him. You start there with this fear, this awe. All right, a, a love that's first and foremost for the love of God and for, his, his, for, for what he has for his creation, right? That's this fear and this awe that we are to fill ourselves with, all right? Who holds the very life, your very life in his hands, who gives you your very breath, like that breath that you've been breathing this morning as we've been sitting here. God's given that to you. That's what causes this fear and this awe within us that he we're so small and finite, and he's so great and grand. Like, that should stir within us a, a righteous fear, right? There should be a little bit of a sense of awe and fear of who he is. So, so we begin there. You begin there. Yet, yet the same God who is great and grand and majestic loves you more than that you could ever dare imagine. So again, I say it this way. You begin there with this fear and love for the Lord, but, but, you, but you never leave there either, right? You, you continue to come back to the, just this beauty and this majesty and the glory of who God is. And so is your, is your heart, is your heart captivated by the beauty of the Lord or is it captivated by the false beauty of this world? All, all, all these things that we see on this, on this planet, they're, they're, they're good things, but they're, they're, they're nothing but shadows, of the beauty and joy found in knowing God and being known by him. And we say they're a shadow because God's created them for the sole purpose of saying, look, look how amazing I am. I created all this. I breathed this into existence. They're but shadows. They're supposed to point us to the real thing. So when you walk in, you see a shadow of a tree on the ground. Like, that's not the real thing. It's, it's causing you to say, oh, there must be a tree behind me, right? So you want to look at the actual thing that's casting the shadow. That's what God has done. He's, he's given us, he's created this world to display the glory and majesty of who he is. They're shadows, but yet in our wickedness and sinfulness, we think that's the real thing. And, and so that's why we, we're chasing thing after thing. They're not meant to satisfy us. This is what Solomon has been trying to, from chapter one to chapter 12 here, is trying to lay before us, pursue that which is greater, be captivated by the beauty and the glory of God. There are only two ways, only two ways to live in this world. Sadly, many will walk the path of the fool, but, but for those who walk the path of the wise, there's health and there's joy and there's meaning and purpose. And when I say health, don't mean just physical health. This is not a prosperity message here. Following Christ may be very difficult. In fact, Scripture actually promises you it will be. In fact, we read from Romans 5 today during communion that you're gonna encounter suffering and difficulty and trials in life, but take heart. It's equipping us to grow us, to be more and more like, more like Christ. And, and so when we talk about health, we're just talking about spiritual health. That, that, that we're being designed and we're in alignment with how he's designed us to be. That's the health we're talking about. This joy and this meaning and purpose is more than just circumstantial things where we just, I'm happy for the day, but this deep, just current of joy that runs underneath, that just continues to carry us. That's the pathway of the wise. So no matter what happens in this life, no matter what happens in this world, our foundation is not in, in sand it's, it's on the rock, it's built, it's strong, it's steady. That's Christ, that's the pathway, that's the walkway of the wise. So, so, so that's what we're called to live. 
So I close with this last question. How, how are you living? How are you living? And how are you intending to discipline yourself to get there, to achieve the goals that God has laid out before us and has given to you and has called you to? Let's pray. So Father, we come before you this morning thanking you that you have given us in your wisdom clear insight to just how to live a wise life. So God, we, we as believers have not been called to just crawl into a hole and just wait until either Jesus returns or we breathe out our last breath. But you have called us to say, okay, this is a life that you've given us. We're breathing here and, and you're allowing us to stay here on this planet with purpose and intentionality. So help us to, to make the best use of the time. To, to walk the pathway of the wise and not the fool. And if anyone's even convicted in here this morning that, you know what, I, I, I think there's a lot of things in my life that would say I'm walking foolishly. Okay, let's repent, confess, and, le and let's, let's ask for the grace of God to then continue to grow us and mature us and make us more like him. All of us in this, in this room are going to have those moments in life where we, where we do foolish things, where we make foolish decisions, where we walk, where we get off track and we walk the pathway of the fool. So God, I pray that in those moments that, that this is why we have the church, we're doing life with one another to call us out of that, to speak life into us, to, to say, listen, you're, you're stepping out of step with, with the gospel, with the word of God, come back. This is why we, we need one another and this is why we need to live life with one another. And so, God, I pray that this would be the culture of this church, that we just love one another so much that, that we, we have sometimes those difficult conversations with one another, those awkward conversations from time to time because we, want to, we, because we love them and we want them to walk in, in holiness and walk um, as, as Christ has intended us to walk towards himself. And so, God, this is what we need to do. This is where we need to go. But, man, we... As I, even I'm saying these words, I realize how dependent we are upon your Holy Spirit to help us. So this is as I close and pray here, this is what I want to pray for, for your spirit to be at work in us who call you by name, who are your sons and daughters. Would you work in our lives, conforming us more and more into the image of your son. And it's for his glory and for his name and his renown that we pray all these things. Amen. <laughs> So as we close here through song and through our giving, um, about a year ago we began a, I guess we could call it a campaign or a push, whatever, we wanna, whatever phrase we want to put on this, to, to get out of debt as a church. We want to pay this building off so that we can do more with our finances for the glory of God in our community and among the nations. And so we started just about a year ago, a year ago March, some were just calling debt reduction. And so we, we give from time to time here just little simple updates on where we are with that. And so over the last year, we paid um, on top of just our regular monthly payment, almost $100,000, a little over $100,000 extra to, to pay down the debt. And so what we're looking to do though is, is each year, each March, we want to do a, a, just another kind of a big push to keep trying to, to knock down the debt more and more and more. And again, it's not just because we want to pay the building off, but because we're thinking vision, we're thinking future, where we want to go and what we want to do. And right now we're just shackled by debt. Debt shackles you. And so we want to get out of debt as quick as we can. So you're going to be hearing us over the next couple weeks and then throughout the month of March talking about a simple thing called an envelope campaign. So if you're here a year ago, um, you might remember this. But starting the first Sunday of March, which is two weeks from today, out in the Welcome Center, there'll be a big board um, that will have 300 envelopes, 300 plus envelopes on there. And uh, what we're asking, we'll send a video out explaining all this. I'm just kind of getting us thinking and preparing and just praying over what you could give to contribute to this. But the thought is you just take an envelope um, as a family. If you want to take multiple envelopes, whatever you want to do, um, but you take one of those and then you, you write a check or you put cash in or whatever it may be throughout the month of March and then you turn that back in in March. And if we take all 300 envelopes, if everybody takes an envelope, that board is empty and all of them get turned in, um, it raises just in that simple thing about $45,000. That 100% of that is all going to just paying down the, the debt payment here, which gets us another step closer to being debt free here as a church, which is we, where we want to go. And so I'm just laying this out before we're going to talk about it again next week um, and then throughout the month of March. But I just want you guys, uh, and I'm talking to our members, our regular attenders here specifically here. So over these next couple weeks, would you as a family and just individually begin to pray, okay, what, what can we give to go towards this? And, and don't do it just because, well, Matt's asking us to do it, so we need to do it. But think through being partners and saying, okay, I'm a part of this church. I'm a part of what's going on here. 
and, and, and because of my love for Jesus, I want to get us out of debt here so we can do more as a church to reach our neighbors, to reach our community, to reach the nations. And so that's the thought of where we can go and how we can move forward. And so we want to be partners together in this. And so I wanted to just share that with you guys just to get us thinking and praying. We'll talk about it again more next week and then throughout the month of March. But again, I, I thank you guys for your generosity and just going above and beyond even just your regular giving because that's what all this is. When I said we gave 100000 over the last year, that's above and beyond what, what you gave just to going towards the church. And so I commend your generosity. Thank you for that. Let's continue. And I think we are modeling the generosity of God in the fact that we are doing this. And so that's what we want to lay before us. But we want, to, we want to give now. This is where we give. This is where we sing. And so ushers will walk down the aisle in just a second here. Place will pass. If you want to give a check, you can do so. There's other ways to give. I give online or text to give. I love it. The, you see the number on the screen. I use it all the time. It's great. Um, super helpful for me and my family. But however you want to give and just be a partner of this ministry, there's, there's multiple avenues for you to do so. And I, I'm not shy about asking because it's not about me. Um, it's not about really anything that we're doing here. It's about we want to, we want to model Worship, and we want to worship through our giving. And so our giving is an act of worship. And so this is why we lay this before us each and every week, because I want us to be worshipers in every area of our life, and that includes our, includes our giving. And so this conforms us more and more to the image of Christ. So let's stand here. Let's sing, let's give, and let's worship together.
joining us this morning. If you're a guest with us, met a few of you guys before uh, the service began this morning, but I'd love to invite you if you're a guest with us this morning before you slip out the doors here to stop by this table. I'll walk down these steps here as we close here. I'd love to just give you a gift as a thank you for joining with us this morning, but just also just to connect with you and get to know you as well. So I'd love to invite you down front here uh, before you head out just for us to give you a gift and, and just say thank you for joining us this morning. Um, this past Friday, we, we celebrated with the uh, Chinese ministry, Chinese New Year. It's one of those things where we really wish we could have opened it up to the entire church, but we stand to space. There were so many things going on in the building. We had to use the Welcome Center, and it was packed, um, just packed with a lot of uh, Chinese, and uh, we just had a great night just kind of celebrating New Year. I got to celebrate New Year's twice this year, which was kind of cool, and so, um, but it was really, just really interesting, and so really fun, and uh, a great way to kind of start things off. One of the things we're looking, though, because we do want to uh, really be intentional on merging the two um, people groups together here. So um, the end of April, the last Sunday of April, which is the fifth Sunday, we're going to do a um, just kind of a church lunch, and we're just going to invite everybody together here just so we can all kind of work and uh, eat together and just get to know one another as well. And so if you haven't got to meet several of the, the Chinese uh, who, have, who have come and been a part of our, our services now, please do so. Just sweet, kind people, and they've said the exact same thing about you all. So thank you again for just being hospitable to them. Um, mission trips. You saw in your uh, bulletin this morning a couple different mission trip opportunities. So if any of those uh, are, are something you're interested in, whether it be Copper Island, Mexico, or NYC, all the dates are there for the trips. Uh, you can go to the info center uh, as we close here and sign up. It doesn't mean you're signing up for the trip. It just means you want more information. And we'll have some informational meetings here in the following weeks for those interested in going. Uh, there's one trip that's not on there because it's somewhat kind of secretive uh, uh, that we are offering as well. But Katie... Uh, one of our missionaries that was sent just uh, a few months ago to the Arabian Peninsula, she's actually asking if there's anybody that would love to spend the end of June through about the middle of August where she is, they're looking for English teachers. And that doesn't mean you're an English teacher, just if you speak English, you can teach it. Um, and so they, that's kind of her main ministry over there, working with Muslim women, um, is, is through teaching them English. And so they're looking for uh, English teachers to come out um, this summer to work alongside of her and their ministry out there. So if you're interested in that, you can go to the Info Center, or you can find me and talk with me about that a little bit more. Um, and so she's very hush-hush about it because it's a closed area of the world where she is. But for those who want to go, we'll, we'll actually let you know where you're going. Um, and so, but a, a great opportunity great opportunity right in the 1040 window where the gospel is needed most. Um, so if you're interested in that, please let me, let me know. Uh, growth track is going on. We'll start here in about 10 minutes or so, our, our February class. March is filled. April is already starting to fill up. If you'd like to be a part of our growth track, which is our way to connect here, join, become a member. But even if you are a member, but you want to just go through it, see who we are as a church, where we're going, but then we're helping you assimilate and connect to the church, you can sign up for April or May. Those months are open, okay? So go to the Info Center to do so as we close. And I close with this passage here in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, which says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Have a wonderful Sunday. Through the depth of your beauty, Jesus, there's no